Hello, welcome to PCAP's fifth Prairie's Got the Goods Week. My name is Caitlin Rose-Siler and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Dr. Samuel Robinson, postdoctoral associate with the University of Calgary, will be speaking about No Farm is an Island, Biodiversity in Prairie Agroecosystems. Before we begin, I'd like to start by stating we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I'd like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. I'd like to note that this presentation is being recorded and will be uploaded to the PCAP YouTube channel in the near future. Our last presentation for Praise Got the Goods Week is tomorrow at 12 p.m. about grazing and soil. I would like to note that PCAP is also hosting a virtual workshop this evening about multiple species management. We also have a webinar next week about invasive species prevention. For more information or to register for these virtual events, just visit the PCAP website and click on upcoming events. Prairie's Got the Goods Week would not be possible without our sponsors. I would like to sincerely thank presenting sponsors Sask Energy and Wildlife Habitat Canada, as well as our supporting sponsors Eco-Friendly Sask and Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association. A reminder to all of our listeners out there, you'll be muted for the duration of the webinar. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the questions section of the webinar dashboard at any time. If you're on a cell phone or using the app, you can send your question by chat to the organizer and questions will be answered at, uh, at the end of the webinar. Now, a bit about today's presenter. Dr. Dr. Samuel Robinson is a postdoctoral associate at the University of Calgary, where he studies the relationships between crop yield, biodiversity, and landscape structure. He hails from White Rock, BC, and received his Bachelor's of Science and Master's of Science from the University of British Columbia, where he studied pollination of high Arctic plants on Ellesmere Island before moving to Alberta to do his PhD on canola pollination at the University of Calgary. He is interested in agriculture and ecology and how the two disciplines can cooperate to solve the problem of providing food to a growing world population while also preserving biodiversity. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to, to Samuel. Hi, everybody. All right. Can you see that? Um, yes. Excellent. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to my talk, which is entitled No Farm is an Island, uh, Biodiversity in Prairie Agroecosystems. And uh, I've already been introduced, so I won't take much of a time to go through this here. Oh, looks like it. Uh, hold on, let me just minimize my own chat box here. There we go. Uh, I won't take too much of a time to go through this, uh, but yes, that's me standing out in a canola field uh, with those fishermen's pants on. Uh, I'm from the West Coast, so I felt it was appropriate. Uh, but yes, originally I'm from White Rock, BC, and I studied out at University of British Columbia uh, before hopping over the mountains to Lethbridge, Alberta, and I did my PhD at the University of Calgary uh, studying canola pollination. And now I still work at the University of Calgary, but I study sort of broader problems uh, related to insects and landscape and biodiversity. So uh, this is a bit of a structure of what the talk is going to be like today. I'm going to talk about what is conservation, what is agriculture in relation to this, uh, kind of a new way of thinking, although I put new with a star there because actually this is quite an old way of thinking, what are lab studies, and then sort of a final word on uh, what I think is possible. All right. So what is conservation? Well, conservation broadly is sort of the setting aside of certain lands uh, for the purpose of preserving different kinds of plants and animals that live in them. And I thought I would start this talk off with a picture of the Carpathian grasslands. The Carpathian grasslands are a set of grasslands from Eastern Europe uh, that encompass several different countries, including Romania uh, and parts of Poland. Um, but you can see that they're very biodiversity rich and they have all, all different kinds of plants and animals that live in them, and they also have people in them. So you can see that there's sort of a town on the back, uh, in the back over there, um, and they've done so for thousands and thousands of years. So I'm going to go into a little bit of history about what I mean by conservation, and I should preface this um, by saying that this is really this is really sort of a history of Western conservation. So uh, if I was to do a talk on indigenous conservation, that would be a whole other lecture, and I'm not very well equipped to do that. So. Uh, I'm going to talk mainly about um, conservation from sort of a Western perspective. 
Uh, so, and from from a European perspective, I guess. Uh, so, in Europe, the, uh, a lot of the kind of talks about conservation started really in the 1600s when there were concerns about deforestation uh, wrecking timber supplies in Europe, uh, as well as the European colonies, like in India. Uh, and then a lot of this kind of, and there was there were also concerns about this in continental Europe, like in Germany as well. Uh, and this idea that we need to preserve certain areas in order to have like a constant supply of timber and the things that come from forests. Uh, then in the 1800s, we got these kind of more uh, sort of a philosophical movement about the ideas about in the inherent value of nature. And I'm thinking here mainly of people like uh, Henry David Thoreau, who's an American uh, from the mid 1800s. Um, and then it, that kind of moved forward uh, with people like uh, Teddy Roosevelt and John Weir in the late 1800s. Uh, and this also result, this resulted in the creation of things like Yosemite National Park, which is one of the first kind of large scale parks that went on. And uh, our claim to fame as Canadians is that in 1911, uh, Parks Canada got created. This is the first National Park Service of any country, I believe, that most parks had sort of like, or most countries had little individual parks, uh, but not a national level of this. Um, and then taking a bit of a jump forward, we have the US EPA being created in the 1970s, which uh, the mandate was sort of broader environmental management beyond just sort of parks. Um, and I'd like to point out here that there was, on most of these issues, there was a fairly broad political consensus. And many of these is issues and ideas were uh, put forward by conservatives. Uh, so I think a lot of people like to kind of uh, like to kind of think that conservation is just an issue that's maybe only important to people on the political left. But historically, that has not been true. Uh, people like Teddy Roosevelt was fairly conservative. John Weir was conservative. Uh, so there, this is this, and I mean Nixon, who made the U.S. EPA, he was conservative. Uh, so this is not just an issue for people on the left. This is this is an issue for all people. Um, and I think we need to kind of recognize that and. Uh, work together on, the, on these kinds of issues. So I'll talk a little bit about conservation in Canada. Uh, so we have national conservation areas like parks uh, and marine conservation areas, wildlife areas and bird sanctuaries uh, that fulfill the function of conservation. Uh, we have other types of parks and conservation areas under provincial legislation, and some of these can actually be used for economic activities. Uh, so on the left here, I have a picture of the Twin River Park down in, or Twin River Heritage Rangeland uh, down in Southern Alberta near the Milk River, uh, which has, you can get public grazing leases to, to uh, graze cattle on it. So that demonstrates that you can, there can be some kind of an economic use in conservation as well. So why is this important? Well, first and foremost, conservation is for humans, really. Um, it's where we it's we can we can do public recreation we can walk in parks we can kind of recharge our batteries so to speak uh, people derive like uh, even like spiritual enjoyment from from these places so this is this is uh, this is a these are important for us and we can also derive some kind of economic use out of this uh, as an example that Banff makes well I don't know how many millions a year on on the tourist sector uh, but it's a it's a fair bit and that's part of our, our national parks. They're also uh, important for maintaining animal and plant diversity um, and uh, sort of under that same subheading of protect, protecting endangered species. Now this is important in an era when a lot of animal and plant diversity has been shown to be going down. Uh, and so keeping these in check is, is, uh, is an important function of these uh, conservation areas. So now some challenges to prairie conservation. Uh, the main thing that, uh, the main reason why there are, are sort of problems in conservation is that there's usage conflicts. So humans, as humans, we like to use the same areas as wild animals and plants. We like to build our houses in areas that are nice. Uh, we like to grow our crops in areas that where they grow well, such as the prairies. And so there's a strong development or a strong push for development in a lot of areas. Uh, so like the prairies have chernozem soils and a climate that's favorable to growing crops. So it's no, it's no, uh, it's no secret that they're, they're highly coveted for a lot of development. Um, and because of this, very little undeveloped prairie remains. Okay, so that's my sort of first chunk on what is conservation. Second part is what is agriculture? Now this is, this should be fairly self-explanatory. It's, it's growing crops or either plants or animals in sort of usually sort of in a large uh, area, usually in a monocrop uh, for our own eating purposes. So now a little bit of history on agriculture. 
Uh, now, again, this is this is mainly a history of sort of Western agriculture, not indigenous agriculture, but that would be a whole other whole other topic. Um, so roughly 10,000 years ago, uh, in several areas in like India and China and modern day Iraq, uh, people figured out how to do large scale agriculture. Uh, oh, also Central America as well. So they figured that if you took the, the seeds from plants and put them all in one area, then you could get these plants that you liked all in one convenient area. So instead of wandering around trying to gather things, you could get them all very quickly. Uh, so then around 8000 BC, there, it's estimated there were around 5 million people on the face of the planet. Sort of astounding, really, when you consider it. Uh, then around 1 AD, uh, around the time of Christ, there was around two th uh, 200 million people. In the beginning of 1800s, there was a billion people. And this was also the advent of the Industrial Revolution in Europe, where, uh, and all of the sort of other things that went along with that, people moving into the cities, people uh, uh, developing much better fertilizers, people developing much better seeding techniques like the seed drill and things like that. Uh, so you can kind of see where this pattern is going here. 19, by 1930, we have 2 billion. Today, we have 7.8 billion people. And today, uh, about 35% of the surface of the planet is agriculture. So that is an astounding number. That is that is immense. When I first thought that, or when I first heard that, I, I thought this was this was kind of insane. Uh, but this is a fairly this is a fairly robust estimate. Uh, about 35% of the surface of the planet that is not that that doesn't have ice on it is agriculture or is used for agriculture in some way. So why is agriculture important? Well, first off, we like eating. I'm enjoying a cup of coffee here. Uh, that was grown by a farmer in Ethiopia. I will have lunch later that where the ingredients come from farms, basically. So I, I like eating and I assume all the rest of you do too. Um, so we need to eat to stay alive. And agriculture is a fairly efficient way of doing that because it kind of packs everything into a, a small area. Uh, other challenges or what other things is that uh, diets are changing. Um, more people are eating meat, especially in the global south, as economic conditions change, and populations are, are continuing to grow. So uh, by 2057, it's estimated we'll have 10 billion people on the planet. And uh, me and my wife had a kid last week or last uh, last December or no last November. Uh, so we're we're, um, we're I include myself in this that I'm adding to that uh, that population. So I think a lot of the problems uh, can be kind of summed up in, in these agriculture conservation conflicts. Uh, so one of the problems that, that, uh, that accompanies agriculture is that biodiversity is usually low. So monocultures are very common. By monoculture, I mean growing only one type of crop or only having only one type of animal in a certain area. Uh, the prophylactic use of pesticides. Uh, prophylactic means kind of using it regardless of whether you need to, uh, mainly since World War II. Uh, I do want to point out I'm not anti-pesticide. I think they have their uses, but I think they should be. We should be careful about using them um, because they're they've been tied to population declines in some groups of animals and plants. And uh, from a farmer's perspective, uh, it's also a problem uh, the sort of overuse of them because you get the evolution of, re of resistant pests, uh, so that you'll have to use more and more and more uh, to kill the same amount of things that are eating your crop. However, I'm not going to I'm not going to trash talk all of agriculture here. We have actually made some improvements in it, uh, especially in the prairies. We've uh, developed no-till practices, so that's uh, helping to conserve soil carbon and uh, keep topsoil in place, uh, and that's a great improvement um, considering what we used to do here. Um, and we've also uh, we've also developed improved varieties of plants and improved types of pesticides and fertilizers that are more targeted for the things that we're interested in. Uh, so there's been it's been kind of a mixed bag. So here's a little bit of a mini summary. On the one hand, we like wild animals and plants. On the other hand, we also like to eat and to pay our bills. On the one hand, we like butterflies and bees and other kinds of wild insects. On the other hand, we don't like pests eating our crops. And finally, we like undeveloped wild prairie because it's uh, beautiful and it's it's rich and biodiverse, but not much of it remains. So these, this is kind of a summary of these, these things that are directly butting heads where agriculture and conservation are, are apparently in conflict. Uh, so how can we resolve this problem? And can we do both prairie conservation and agriculture simultaneously? I would argue the, the answer to this question is yes, but it, re it requires a bit of a different set of thinking. 
So here's my new way of thinking. And again, I, I put new way, but really this is actually uh, his, historically in the, in the academic literature, this was developed in the 80s. Um, and, but the, the, the idea of this is, is actually very, very old. So solving this problem requires a change of thinking and in practice. And I'm, I argue that we need to move from the view of agriculture to the view of agroecosystems. And so what that means is that the neighboring fields and non-crops are part of the same system. What you do in your field, if you spray pesticides or if you have a certain type of plant, it may affect your neighbor, right? And so, and by that same token, uh, farmers are getting value from the landscape, not just from the planted area. If there's areas that have, say, uh, bees that are pollinating the crop, uh, then that might be, that's free pollination service. That's more, that's more dollars in their pocket. Um, but again, that's, that's not something you, you really take care of in the same way that you take care of the rest of the crop. Um, and farmers uh, can largely be, uh, farmers are very clever people. Uh, and I think we should start to think of farmers more as applied ecologists. They do a lot of the same things that I think ecologists do. They manage plant and animal populations. Uh, they manage nutrient flows in and out of certain areas. Uh, so I think that it's not a huge stretch for farmers to be kind of viewed more as applied ecologists or landscape managers. Uh, and broadly, this requires considering the entire landscape as part of the system, both for conservation and for agriculture. And so this is my, this is my, my way forward to solve this problem, or at least to um, chip away at the problem. So I'm going to give you a bit of a course example here. This is one of the fields that we use for our studies up near Vermilion an undisclosed location near Vermilion up. Well, you can see the range road there, so it's not undisclosed, but it's uh, it's up near Vermilion though. Uh, but you can see in this landscape, you can see multiple features. There's late, there's uh, big wetlands, there are crop fields, and there are bits of forest and uh, things like that around. Now I'm going to take an extreme perspective from the view of a farmer. Now say I was a farmer that only cared about whether these lands turned to profit. I might be tempted uh, now, most farmers don't do this. Most farmers are more kind of broad-minded than this. But I'm, if I was just a purely profit-maximizing farmer, I might think like this. Um, that, these that these areas that I have crops on, these lighter colored areas, will bring me money. And then these black areas over here are a waste of space. And if I was this farmer, I would be tempted to say that how can I turn those black areas that I, that I own, that are on my land, how can I make them produce crops for me as well? So this might this is kind of one extreme view. Now the other extreme view, I'm going to take an extreme conservationist perspective. And here the landscape has been inverted. So now we have all of the crop fields are again kind of a black hole. There's nothing nothing of value in there really. Um, and then we have all of the areas around here, like this forested area with some deer in it. Uh, we have these wetlands that have ducks and other kinds of uh, birds in them. But by and large, there's there's nothing really of value in these areas, and that the, these are just kind of little islands in a sea of uh, a sea of like a desert, basically a, a conservation desert. Now I'm going to uh, offer a synthetic perspective to put these two things together. So I think what we need to start doing is thinking of the whole system uh, rather than just these two components. Um, and this I'll I'll show you why this is important in a little bit. But if we could learn to think like this, I think this will be this would be helpful. So if we can think of the landscape as not just uh, valuable or not valuable, but sort of a flux of these different processes going on. Over here, we can see this bumblebee, which is the size of Godzilla in these photos here, uh, going in in and out of these uh, croplands and deriving maybe it's gathering pollen or or nectar from these crops that are grown here. Um, and in turn offering pollination services to the crops. We have different kinds of spiders. We have, uh, these are wolf spiders here. Again, going into these crops and eating pest insects. We have harvestmen doing the same, uh, which are a relative of this, they're related to spiders. We have other kinds of things like uh, ground beetles, which are another type of predatory, uh, predatory beetle moving into and out of these fields uh, and again, consuming pests. So again, providing free pest control service for, for farmers, but then moving back into these wilder areas or these un, un, uh, these un, non-cropped areas at the end of the season when the crop is gone so that they can lay their eggs and reproduce. So I think uh, solving this problem, uh, now this, this is valuable both for farmers and for conservationists, I think. So, uh, be, and the reason for that is because it 
opens up a greater suite of conservation targets and lets us practice conservation in the midst of agriculture, not just sort of as a side note. Uh, so instead of just us, instead of say you wanted to, you were interested in conservation, you might have to buy this entire quarter section down here and develop it into a, a, con a conserved area. Whereas in, in the new perspective, we can view the entire landscape as sort of a potential conservation. So, and some low hanging fruit here. Uh, th now these are things that are fairly, these are things that would not interfere too much with the current system, uh, I think. Uh, one potential target is road margins. So on the side, on the side photo over here, I have a, this is a photo from near Camrose. Uh, and you can see there's fairly wide margins in the roads uh, near to most highways. Uh, now in, uh, earlier this week, I was in a meeting with uh, someone from the city of Calgary who manages their roads. And he manage and uh, he he manages the the grass and the plants on the sides of the roads, and he manages literally hundreds of th hundreds, if not thousands, of hectares of land just in Calgary. So this is this is a huge. Uh, if we could find a way to uh, make these roads valuable for conservation, this would be this would be immense. Uh, we also have things like. Uh, field edges and pivot corners. So again, this is a uh, this is a bit of land near one of the canola fields we were studying. Uh, so now these are areas that are, uh, for whatever reason, are not planted. Um, but I think these are fairly valuable conservation targets, or or uh, these could be these could be made into conservation targets. There's also things like uh, the prairie potholes. So these are wetlands uh, that are semi-permanent in a lot of uh, fields. And the last bit would be unprofitable field areas. So that's kind of harder to show in this diagram, um, but there are certain parts of the field where the cost of the fertilizers, the cost of the pesticides, and the cost of the seed do not break even to the value of the crop that is coming off of that. Uh, for instance, earlier this week I'd, I'd, uh, I was sent a paper that was from a study down in Iowa where they were trying to estimate how much fields are actually profitable, and they came up with this astounding figure that about 27 percent of fields or 27% of the area that is planted is not making the farmer any money. Now that is a huge number. Um, I thought it was I thought it was going to be way lower than that. But uh, if we could if we could figure out where those areas are, um, this would be savings for the farmer. They don't have to pay uh, money for these things that are losing them money. And this would be possible conservation uh, if you can plant perennial grasses and forbs and things like that in these areas. So I think we also we should also start thinking about uh, we should start moving from precision agriculture. This is sort of a big buzzword in a lot of agriculture that using this, we can also move to or think about precision conservation in these areas. So here's some examples of some areas from Alberta. Uh, this is down near Lethbridge on the on the left hand side of the, the figure here. This is a, a field that I used from my, uh, my PhD work. Uh, they use a lot of central pivot irrigation in southern Alberta. Uh, these pivot corners are typically just perennial grasses. I think these are areas that could be considered for conservation. Uh, we have remnant pastures that sometimes are mowed and sometimes are not. But again, these are these are these are not maybe areas that you would uh, that that would be traditionally considered for these these kinds of things. But I think that they could be useful. So if we can find ways to use agroecosystems for conservation, this is an immense. This presents an immense area for conservation efforts. Uh, so the total growing, the growing area that's used in the prairies uh, is roughly uh, 500,000 uh, kilometers squared. So half a million kilometers squared. To put it in perspective, the size of the entire United Kingdom is 250,000. So we have an area here that is twice the size of the UK uh, in order to, that we could work with. And if we can, if we can, even in, if we, even if we can include even if we can improve conservation outcomes by just a couple percent, if we can get like a couple more species in there and roll it out across the entire prairies, imagine what we could do for conservation efforts, right? So this is this. I think we we can we can think of agriculture as an opportunity, not sort of a hindrance to conservation. So an example of this from the United Kingdom. Speaking of the UK, uh, in the UK, in a lot of places, they'll use what are called uh, hedgerows or beetle banks. Uh, and these are used for conserving different kinds of native plants, uh, but they also serve a function for the farm. So uh, hedgerows were developed back in, in well, really in the 1600s, uh, after the common lands uh, were, so it used to be in, in the UK that uh, the, a lot of the areas around town 
uh, the, those were sort of owned by everyone and you could graze your animals. But slowly uh, that started being separated into individual parcels of land and these hedgerows were used to, uh, to do that. Uh, but now they play host to uh, different kinds of animals like birds and bees and beetles that live in these hedgerows. And then during the, when the crops are being grown, these animals will move out into the crops and uh, provide services like pollination and predation in the crops. And then they can move back during the winter and have somewhere to lay their eggs or overwinter. And it's the same with these beetle banks here. So on, on the right hand side, these beetle banks are really just a raised bit of turf uh, where they pile up dirt and then they plant perennial grasses on it. But these, this, and this is sort of a quick and, a quick and easy hedgerow uh, for the same purposes that beetles can uh, lay their eggs and overwinter in these beetle banks and survive uh, until the next year. So given that this, we have this new, given this new way of thinking, this opens up a bunch of different other kinds of questions about what we could, what we could do with this. So what kinds of organisms actually live in these marginal habitats? Uh, how much of this, these marginal habitats is necessary and are certain types better than others? Um, do different kinds of organisms move between crops and non-crops? Or, I mean, if they just stay in the non-cropped areas, that's not really of, of interest to growers, but it might be of interest to conservationists. Uh, are these organisms helpful or harmful? Uh, just because they move into the crop doesn't mean that they're doing good things. Uh, so do we need to think about, uh, do we need to think about those and consider those when, when uh, making these areas? And how much cropland is consistently profitable? Uh, I mentioned that Iowa study uh, that said 27% of these corn and soybean fields uh, are unprofitable, uh, but we have almost no information on that for anywhere in Canada, really. Um, but I think with precision agriculture, that presents sort of a way that we can, uh, we can help with a lot of that. So now I'll talk a bit about, now I'll give a bit of a, a plug for what we do in our lab. So uh, what do we do in our lab, uh, besides, as you can see, walking through potted canola fields? Well, we're interested in a couple of questions that are sort of related to what I was what I was talking about. Uh, but what kinds of arthropods live in agricultural areas? Uh, what kinds of landscapes are best for arthropod diversity and abundance? And do some of these insects and other arthropods actually help crop yields? Uh, and so the area of our the area of focus, as we as I said before, is this prairie pothole region, which again is almost half. It's about half a half a million kilometers squared. Uh, which is 128 million uh, acres. So it's an immense area. And uh, we're interested, we, I mean, we pri we're, from, we're in Calgary, so we primarily study things in uh, Alberta. Uh, but you can see we have these different trapping locations marked in red, in these red dots around here, and on these little maps around here. And we have, uh, since 2015, we've been engaged in uh, a series of projects that trap uh, insects in ditches and in off and in uh, marginal habitats, so things like pivot corners, um, in order to look at how what kind of biodiversity actually exists, because this information um, doesn't really exist in a lot of places, especially in Canada. Uh, this is actually very, very new information for a lot of uh, a lot of us. And we've also included uh, by these blue and blue boxes and blue circles, uh, things like infield wetlands and other kinds of uh, areas that are on the side of fields or or sort of in in the middle of fields in order to see what are how valuable are these in terms of conservation. And the result is that we have a lot of different bugs. So uh, in the top left here, we have four different kinds of bees. These are bumblebees. Uh, that is an osmia, a, a uh, mason bee. Uh, we have this bright green one, which is a sweat bee. And then we have this one, uh, this other one, which I believe is a nomada. So that is a cuckoo bee. But we have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of bees in our collection here, uh, and we've and we've cataloged their species diversity. So we have uh, about 307 species of solitary bee, and 25 species of bumblebees, and one species of honeybee. Uh, now, when most people think of bees, they just think of honeybees. But really, we have uh, we have well over 300 different species of bees that are not honeybees just in Alberta alone. We also uh, have recently started looking into other kinds of uh, other kinds of organisms like spiders and harvestmen. So that would be these two down here. That's a wolf spider and a harvestman. And then ground beetles as well, these shiny black beetles that you, uh, you see here. And the result of that is that we have about 220,000 
different arthropod records. So this makes us one of the largest collections of arthropods in Canada, and almost certainly uh, the largest in uh, Western Canada. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about a project I'm directly involved in, uh, into looking at how valuable these non-crop areas are for arthropods. So things like spiders and ground beetles can provide free pest control for farmers, uh, and grasslands and shrubs and wetlands can act as potential overwintering areas, but we don't really know where a lot of these critters actually live, and do they move between different, uh, do they move between the crop and these non-crop areas? So what areas should we prioritize? So I took a crack at looking at this. Uh, I used a sam some of our sampling areas uh, between Calgary and High River, as well as some over near towards Brooks, where we sampled insects in roadsides and infield sites. And I chose these four uh, to look at. These are fairly common predators. I call them, the. this is the rogues gallery here. Uh, on the top left is Terosticus melanarius, which is a fairly common uh, carabid beetle or a ground beetle. Uh, and all of these are predators. Uh, some of them are omnivores, like the harvestman down in the bottom right here. So again, a relative of the spider. Uh, and then we have these two different kinds of wolf spiders, Pardosa distincta and Pardosa, mo Pardosa moesta. Uh, and I looked at their abundance and tried to tie their abundance to the composition of the landscape around them. Do some landscapes get more of these than others? And do we see that at different times of the year? And what I found is that generally uh, we have, for these three at least, we have evidence of uh, that these critters are in fields, that they're in farmers' fields, um, but then they migrate out of them uh, during the late summer. So at the end of the summer, uh, they, it appears that they start to migrate out of these fields and into these marginal habitats, uh, which means that they are likely overwintering in these. And again, this is very new information because we don't have a whole lot of information on any of these critters, uh, where they live, when they reproduce, all of this kind of thing, or even what they eat a lot of the times. Uh, but for the other one, for the harvestmen, uh, what I found was interesting is that we have, uh, uh, that we found, I think this one actually lives in the fields. So uh, I found that this moves towards uh, towards grasslands in the early summer, just as the crop is uh, just as the crop is getting established. So I think this is sort of the other this is sort of the other uh, side of the double-headed arrow. You remember how in that diagram of the landscape, how I had those those air, those arrows going back and forth between the crop and the the rest of the landscape. This one is going from the crop back to the to the non-crop areas. So we can see that these are moving around, uh, and that. Uh, what we have some evidence to suggest that grasslands uh, and roadsides and woodlands, uh, so that's what I called shrubbed areas or uh, forest areas, uh, may provide overwintering habitat for these three uh, different kinds of predators. All right, so now the next two studies are in progress, so I can't show you the juicy results of this yet, uh, but the, the gist of these studies is that wild bees like this uh, Andrena pernor or Andrena pernorum, uh, which is a, a solitary bee on the left-hand side over here, uh, provide or they can provide pollination services to canola crops, and spiders and ground beetles can provide free pest control to canola crops. But how important are they really? Like, if we removed all of these, would the would all of the the yield in the canola crops go down, or would it stay about the same? Um, and uh, really, nobody really knows this question. So we're we're taking a crack at studying this. So we have some sampling areas up near Vermilion uh, that are placed uh, near to and away from a potential source of these critters. So you can see that this wetland that's surrounded by uh, trees and shrubs here, that's sort of our source, our source location for a lot of these critters. And then we have these exclosure tents that are set up. So these tents uh, will keep the insects out of certain plots of canola. And then we have this one here is called a sham. So it has the, both, it's the same tent, so it provides shade but the doors are open so they can get in and out. Uh, and so hopefully what this, what we're aiming to find out from this is how much value do these critters provide to the, uh, to the yield of canola crops in, uh, specifically. And then the final one I'll just touch on briefly here uh, is I'm involved in a study that uses precision agriculture. Uh, so uh, modern combines have sensors on the back uh, that let you record what specific area of the field you're getting the most grain from. So you can see in this map over here, the lighter areas represent areas with a lot of, where they harvested a lot of grain. And then the darker areas down here represent lower uh, areas with lower grain. And so this data can let us look at yield, date, uh, yield on mass. 
And then we can ask questions like, how do the edge features, like whether it's a forest or a grassland, how, does that change the yield? Uh, do we get higher yields or, or maybe uh, does the yield decrease less quickly uh, away from these or away from these kinds of features? And using this data, this allows comparison across dozens of fields um, at fairly high levels of statistical power. Uh, now I won't bore you too much with the details, but that's uh, that's basically what I'm what I'm involved in currently. All right, so I'm almost done here, uh, but I will tell you a small. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story, uh, final word, uh, and that this is the starting line. So I'll tell you a little bit of a story from when I was uh, back at UBC and one, and uh, you'll notice that I put the same picture here of the Carpathian grasslands. That's because one of my colleagues in one of my classes uh, back at UBC was from Romania and she was studying diversity in these Carpathian grasslands. And uh, she, I asked a question and she had kind of an answer that I didn't really expect. And it, it started to change a lot of how I view ecology, I think. Uh, so, I asked her what she was doing and she said, well, I'm looking at these, these grasslands and I'm looking at what kinds of species live in these landscapes and where there's more diversity and where there's less and, and that kind of thing. And I said, okay, cool. Well, are, uh, where are, the, are you comparing it to like undisturbed areas? And, and she was like, well, what do you mean by undisturbed? And I said, well, like areas that people haven't touched, like people haven't developed or anything like that. And she's like, what do you mean haven't touched? We've been here since the Bronze Age. So there's like, that that wasn't even that wasn't even a thing. Like all of this area, humans have had their their humans have had their hands in this entire area for the last like six thousand years, basically. Uh, and this is kind of what it looks like. So now I think this is a this is a little hard to do, but I think we need to start thinking about what we want our grasslands to look like in another maybe not six thousand years, but maybe in another hundred years. What do we want our grasslands and our agriculture to look like? Uh, when our grandchildren are kicking around, when they're kind of running the show. Uh, so I think this requires both a change in the focus of like how wide we see the landscape as well as how long how long we see our impact lasting because uh, we're in this landscape for good or for ill and I, uh, I would like to make it uh, for good. And with that, I will thank you for listening and uh, I hope and uh, I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for the awesome presentation. Um, such a great overview and so many interesting concepts um, that you've, you've brought together there. So thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, quite a few questions um, written in by listeners okay. already. Um, do you want to just so, filter uh, them to me or? Uh... Sure. Yeah, let's oh. do that. <laughs> a listener named May, she says, crops is not the only farm a form of agriculture. Where does rangelands and pasture used for grazing fall into your conservation view? And how do they rate regarding promotion of conservation outcomes? Uh, for example, that area in the southwest of the Vermilion site looks like a pasture to me. Are, and are the Carpathian grasslands currently grazed? Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer it backwards. Yes, the Carpathian grasslands are grazed, um, and I think yes, there's definitely a, uh, I think there's definitely a place for that. I'm not sure how it would compare in co in comparison to crops. I suspect it would be probably higher because uh, grazed grasslands usually have more than one species of crop. Uh, I mean that gets also into questions of like what's an appropriate level of grazing, um, but I would suspect that they're probably higher in diversity in general. Uh, I think. Um, but yeah, I'd say I'd say there there's definitely a, a a part to play in in that kind of thing, um, and that they don't that these that rangelands don't just uh, they're not just a home for cattle that they're a home they're home for lots of other different kinds of things as well. That's right. Awesome. Thank you for that answer. Um, Andrea is wondering, do you find the expected species are actually coming to the hedgerows and beetle banks? Um, is it a, if you build it, they will come situation or mm -hmm. are there additional efforts required to achieve the invertebrate communities you're after? Okay. Uh, the short answer is we don't know, um, but the the long answer, uh, so and I'll, I'll provide a caveat for that. Um, a lot of the stuff is very new in what we're studying. Uh, a lot of this hasn't really been studied before. Um, in terms of the, if you build it, they will come. A lot of those kinds of things are kind of hard to build. Um, for, I mean, beetle banks, that's pretty, that's pretty straightforward. You make these, you make these uh, uh, ridges with, with perennial grasses on it. Um, but for other things like hedgerows, those take many, many years to set up. And some of those hedgerows in England, especially, have been there for hundreds of years at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
I would say that it's I would say it's probably easier to save what you have rather than to build new things. Um, and but there's not a whole and and I'm well, I mean that's sort of that's sort of for for most things in life really. Um, it it would be easier if we could save current ones than focus on making new ones because we don't have a lot of experience in making new ones. Um, and also that costs a lot of money. So yeah, hope that answers your question. Yes, yeah, beetle banks are so interesting. I've never heard of the term before, but I'm gonna have to look into it a little bit more. Um, yeah, so Katie is wondering if you have any issues with pests being attracted by hedgerows or beetle banks. With uh, pests, sorry? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure, well, I, again, um, we haven't actually looked into that, although that would be interesting. Um, Possibly, yeah. So you you could have you could theoretically have it, it's not just good critters coming good uh, critters that would would uh, be beneficial to farmers coming out. It could be uh, pest ones, or or they could act as reservoirs for uh, like weed populations and things like that. Um, again, at this at this point, we don't really have any information on that. Unfortunately, um, it's it's possible that it could occur. Um, but again, we don't really have a whole lot of info. Uh, what I do know is that a lot, oftentimes um, the pest species are tend to be fairly quick growing ones. So ones that will, uh, they reproduce very, very quickly and predators usually take a little bit longer. Um, and so for th that's sort of from ecological theory. Um, that's why sort of higher diversity areas tend to have lower numbers of these very quick growing kind of pesty species uh, because they've had enough time to build up a predator population. Um, so I suspect there would be some pest spillover. I'm not sure that would outweigh the predators coming that would come along with that. But again, mm. that's that's an open question, though. Yes, very good question. That's yeah. Yeah, definitely interesting. Uh, Jerry says, "What do you think about economic incentives to agriculture landowners to manage more conservation acres, such as the low-hanging fruit, grazing animals on native grasslands, etc.? Um, as this benefits the landowner and society, then government should consider helping to provide these economic in incentives, um, specifically unproductive farmland and re-establishing vegetation cover to support insects, pollination, carbon storage, etc." Yes, I heartily agree. Um, yeah, and they actually do this in a lot of different areas. Uh, down in the in the United States, they do. Uh, they'll actually pay people to take certain pieces of their acreage out of production, um, and then they'll they'll basically just write them every a check every year as long as they keep this area as as a wild grassland. Um, as far as I know, we don't do that here. Although I'm not a policy expert, so I'm I I may be missing something in there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that would. I think the again the low hanging fruit. I, that, that's why I that's why I described it as low hanging fruit because I think if we can do these things without bothering people too much. I mean this is this is sort of the ultimate policy thing. Um, is it if if we can do it without um, bothering people too much? Uh, that would those would probably be the first targets to go after, and those may not even need um, economic incentives. Mm -hmm. Like it, it might be just uh, sort of a, a a policy from say the the government. Okay, now we're going to plant instead of just planting turf grass in the road margins, now we're going to plant uh, a native prairie seed mixture. Uh, that might be kind of a start to that. But then, yeah, you could you could consider other policy options like um, we'll pay you to have, say, a 10 meter boundary around your entire around your entire field and we'll pay you for whatever you whatever you've uh, you've lost from that. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely policy options you could you could consider. Um, yeah. Yeah, great idea. Lots of potential there. Uh, Jessica is wondering, how does native vegetation and ecosystems play into your eco-ag? Uh, hedgerows in the prairie is not something that she would see as a benefit where shrubs and trees would um, create fragmentation, for example. Uh, it depends what you mean by that. Um, I, I, I guess I'd have to ask some follow-up questions to that. Um, what we've I guess it kind of depends on, I'm sort of looking at sort of just um, how can I maximize the acreage of, of, of conservation on the prairies writ large? Um, not so much like, can I make one large area that's all conserved? Um, I would say that areas that are like, if you have, if you can get a cup, if you can get some hectares along the, along roadsides uh, that are, that are connected to each other in some way, that that would probably be, that that's, that's sort of what I'm interested in. Um, in terms of fragmentation stuff, um, 
I can talk, I, maybe I can answer this, I can, maybe I can talk to you a, a little bit about this later. Um, but in terms of a lot of conservation stuff, uh, the sort of prevailing wisdom uh, has historically been that you need that, say you say you wanted to conserve 100 acres of something, or mm -hmm. uh, that you would need, that the best solution would be to have all those 100 acres in like a perfect box or a circle where it's all kind of in one area. Um, and that would be better than if you had 100 acres dispersed over a wider area. Um, now that turns out to be not true, actually. Uh, there's some new research that's come that's come out um, that's actually from a uh, from a Canadian author um, that's shown that for a lot of different things, especially small things like like plants or insects, um, that if you can conserve that, it's it's actually it's probably better if you spread your conservation targets over a large area. Now that doesn't deal with things like uh, large organisms like deer and uh, and other and other kinds of big critters that need more kind of continuous spaces, but it, that that also kind of depends on your definition of what is what is conservation. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I hope that answers that answers a bit of your question. But I I think from my perspective anyway, any anywhere where we can conserve is better than none. Interesting. Sounds great. Um, another listener is wondering or comments in Alberta, we have over 300,000 honeybee colonies, 40% mm. of the bees in Canada. Um, and this person's wondering if you were looking at the impact of these high density of honeybees on native bee species in Alberta. I'm not, but one of my buddies is. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so one of my, uh, one of my buddies from the UFC, uh, Ron Miksha, he's, he's studying well, he's studying uh, honeybees in urban settings specifically. So he's looking at honeybees in Calgary and he's looking whether that changes populations or whether we think that's changing populations of uh, wild bees as well. Um, we haven't done that for the non outside of Calgary, but we could, that's sort of on our, that's sort of on our list of, of things to do. Uh, so yeah, we're, we'll get to that. <laughs> um, yeah. Awesome. That's great. Um, there is, okay, a listener named Natalie. She says, with your data with P. melanarius moving between crop and margin land, uh, how far did you measure into the crop to collect? And is this published data? So uh, I'll answer it backwards. It's currently in review. So it hopefully will be published uh, fairly soon. And this is, that, and that's exactly why we're, we're interested in providing some evidence for these, these kinds of efforts here. Uh, we had we had traps that were most of them were kind of at the edge, uh, but we did have some that were right into the center of the fields. Great, thanks. And a listener named May is wondering if you can share the title of the research that says a block of habitat is less favor favorable than many smaller clusters. Ah. Let me see here. I will go to just a second here. I got to pause my screen sharing. Uh, Yeah, you can see my my ugly mug here. Uh, <laughs> um, hold on, I'm just I'm just bringing up the I'm just bringing up my reference list. So maybe I can I'll I'll look that up and then I'll I'll answer that after the the next one, I guess. Sure. Yeah. No problem. Um, Jude is wondering: Do you look at densities or diversity of insects within fields as well as in margins or non-farmed land? And if so, do you see any differences? Uh, density versus diversity. Um, mainly, we've just been looking at density. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, there are differences between farmed and non-farmed land. Um, some of them, some of them just like hanging out in farmed areas. Uh, and but again, that's that'll hopefully be out in our in our published research. In terms of in terms of diversity, um, we haven't done. I mean, this this data set is actually fairly new, and I'm kind of one of the first people that really gets to dig their hands into it. Um, so, uh, we haven't really done a whole lot of work on community, on the community level, although that would be, that would be interesting though. Um, yeah, that would, I think yeah. the, and I have a, I have the reference, uh, the author for that is Leonor Farig, and she is out of, uh, university, uh, I think she's at Brock University. Okay, uh, great. If, if you want, um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what, how, how, uh, how useful this would be, but I could I could maybe send you a link to that if people if people want. Um, sure, yeah. But yeah. Um, 
Otherwise, um, you could put it into the chat section on the dashboard and just ah. um, send to everybody or if you send it to me too, then I can send it to everybody. Okay, okay. <laughs> that, would that might be too. a couple yeah. too many, might be a couple too many balls to keep in the air while, uh, while I'm answering <laughs> questions, but so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll probably just, I'll probably just send it, uh, send it to you afterwards. Yeah, yeah, that would work too. And I'll send it to everyone. Perfect. Okay. Um, so Irene said, um, you said that adjacent areas can provide important ecosystem services like free um, pest control. How about the desirable services like provision of herbivores and potential pests? If we choose only edges that benefit only predators, for example, is it not another way to become uniform the landscape to benefit only one species over another affecting herbivore communities? Let me, s okay. Uh... Well, I, okay, so first off, I don't think it's really possible to manage only for one species. Um, so I think if we, if we manage, if we come up with some plan, like say we need these buffer strips at the, the between fields or something like that, um, mm -hmm. I think it's pretty unlikely there was only, there would only be one species of predator. Um, I'm not sure that answers your question, but I, I don't think it will, I don't think it will do what, uh, what, what you suggest. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> no problem. And a listener named Colin is wondering um, if you've studied ants at all. They seem to be Ooh. anywhere. <laughs> uh, no, I haven't actually even looked in the collection for that. That would be interesting. Um, no, I, yeah. ha I know we haven't studied, but that would be that would be cool. I, I quite like ants. Yes. <laughs> um, and Laura is wondering, are you including soil microbial populations and communities in your non-cropped areas research? Mm, that's kind of getting outside of the, the scope of what our lab does. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do know that the ABMI does that. Um, so the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, um, they do, they're interested in soil microbes and, and um, critters that live in the soil, like mites and columbolins and things like that. Uh, so we don't do that, but there are some other groups in Alberta that do. Okay, great. Um, just on that note, um, there's been a few people typing in some comments and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody mentioned that um, Alice Canada um, Alternative Land Use Services, um, and they're located in Alberta, and they pay producers to conserve wetlands, shelter belts, mm -hmm. um, and there would be information for people about that at their county or municipality. Yep. Um, there you go. Yeah, there's, which is great. Yeah, so <laughs> Yeah, um, and then another listener has typed in that they've done some pitfall trapping uh, within fields at field edges in eastern Ontario and they caught tons of ants. So yeah, quite interesting. There's um, yeah. a fascination with, <laughs> with ants, ants, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, sorry, we've got lots of comments coming in. It's great. And let me just find our next question. Um, a listener named Daniel is wondering how insects are attracted to the traps. Uh, do you catch any grasshoppers? Are there arthropods you study primarily? Are the arthropods you study primarily active in daytime, such as pollinators, or nighttime, such as predators? Yeah, we actually. That's a good. Yeah, good question. So we use a couple of different traps. Um, the main one I was looking at was pitfall traps. So what they are, they're just uh, they're a red solo cup that we bury up to the lip of the cup in the dirt, mm -hmm. and then we put a mixture of propylene glycol and water, and that okay. helps because uh, water tends to evaporate and glycol does not. Uh, so and then we put a little bit of a mesh screen over top so that we don't catch too many. Uh, frogs and mice and things like that in our traps. Mm -hmm. uh, although some of them do manage to sneak through, they're very they've, they've got a lot of time on their hands. Um, but that's the that's we don't really use any we don't use pheromone baits or anything like that. We just use uh, simple traps like that. Uh, we do uh, we have a couple of our sites where we have bowl traps, so they're just bowls with uh, like colored bowls with soapy water in them uh, or glycol in them. And then the one for bees we mainly use is uh, blue vein traps. So those are, it's kind of like a bucket with this big blue kind of crossed set of plastic uh, veins. Um, and then the bees will run into that thinking they found the, the biggest flower they've ever seen. Um, and then they hit there and then fall into the bucket and that's the end of them. Uh, so, uh, but again, that's only, a, that's just a visual trap. That's not a, there's no pheromones or smelly things in there. Okay, okay, interesting. Thanks for that answer. Um, Colin is also wondering about birds and insects. If you looked at the overlap, um, population of insects required to support bird population, or that might be out of the scope of your lab work. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, I mean, yes, I would, I would, yeah, there, so there is, that's, 
yeah, that is out of the scope of our lab work. We don't really study birds, but uh, but yeah, there's there's for sure a connection between them. Um, yeah, especially insectivores on the prairies. Okay, great. Um, I think that's all the questions that that we have. Um, there's lots of comments coming in, um, so I'll just read a few of these to you if that's okay. Uh, sure. Laura says, absolutely amazing and important work. We need more advocacy, research, and support for the concept of the importance of messy spaces. Thank Daniel for sharing your work. Um, really nice comment there. Um, there's another one, uh, informative and enlightening presentation. Um, Wow, great stuff to think about. No question, just wanted to relay my gratitude. Um, so <laughs> yeah, this yeah. has been a really, really interesting presentation. Um, and That's there great. is, yeah, there is a few people who have typed in about uh, Dr. Lenore Farig. Um, they yep. commented that um, that Dr. Farig is actually at Carleton University, oh, not Brock. My, mis um, my mistake, yeah. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Yeah, and it looks like there's um, some debate on whether her habitat amount hypothesis has more support than the traditional yeah. um, on habitat. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the thing I didn't mention is that this is actually a very contentious, uh, this is a very contentious thing, um, not, just in, not just in conservation, but in ecology writ large. Um, a lot of the sort of prevailing attitudes have been that uh, you need, this is, this is also called the sloss problem, single large or several small. Um, and her her paper is well, which I will which I will send to you afterwards. Um, is one of the kind of the first main cracks at the uh, that maybe we don't need a single large, maybe the several small is better. Um, but again, this is quite a this is an ongoing topic of research. Uh, so there is there is contention in this. Uh, I do recognize that. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Um, well, different perspectives gives us something to research and things yep. to think about. And yeah, yep. that's where we go from there. Yeah, yeah. And one other listener is wondering if you have a funding acknowledgement slide. Oh, yeah, sorry about that, yeah. Um, yeah, we got funding from a lot of different people. We got from ABMI, some from Ducks for the wetland work, or Ducks Unlimited for the wetland work, uh, mm -hmm. some from uh, NSERC. Uh, I'm supported by MyTax. Uh, and part part of my funding is also from the Canola Council of Canada. Um, but yeah, are are you going to be uh, are you going to be posting this lecture online or? Uh... Um, yeah, so we have um, we just kind of record the webinar and then put it on the PCAP YouTube channel. Um, okay. But if you wanted to include something, I can add it into yeah. the comments. That like would that. that would be good. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, yeah, that would that's that is a uh, that's that's something that I forgot here. But I can yeah, I'll I'll send you a. Uh, uh, slide because yeah we we were funded by several groups for this okay awesome yeah it's always good to give them recognition yeah, <laughs> yeah. um and there's one comment from trevor um he, uh, he said this sounds really good and very practical for smaller creatures but would not work for many of the birds that are declining on native prairie from habitat fragmentation but a great adjunct to the conservation of larger blocks and corridors do you have any comments about that uh Again, I mean, we aren't we aren't specifically interested in in or we aren't specifically studying birds. Birds are important, but mm -hmm. that's not yes. just not what our that's not what our lab. You can't study everything. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah. I think I think my view of this anyway is that so much of this is unstudied. Um, like even even just about where some of these critters live, uh, we don't really know. Uh, some of them are introduced, like the Terosticus melanarius. That that's originally from Europe. Um, so that's that's an that's an introduced species, um, but it's all over the prairies now, um, and we know very little about where they live, even what they eat. So a lot of this is is not just uh, is is not kind of getting a, like a broad like we should do exactly this. A lot of this is kind of bit like the building blocks of the foundation. Like where do these things live? What do they eat? Do they move in and out of crops? These are pretty these are pretty simple questions that really don't have an answer at this point. Um, and I mean it may be. This, these are kind of these aren't these aren't very sexy questions. These are kind of these are kind of uh, basic ones, but they're I think they're they're important. Um, and if we don't have this kind of thing, then it's hard to talk about um, concrete measures. That it, like if we want to support more biodiversity, um, then it's hard to talk about that without data because otherwise, then you're just left with I think this is better, and I don't like your idea. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I think I think a lot of I think a lot of what I'm interested in is just sort of the basic the basic building blocks of these these things. Um, I'd also like to add that um, invertebrates as a whole are very unstudied compared to vertebrates. Um, 
and I mean, like I, I showed you, I showed on that figure, uh, for bees alone, we have over 300 species of bees, right? Um, that's that's quite a lot, right? And this is in a fairly small area that we've that we've been studying, right? Definitely. So, uh, and but just as on on the whole, invertebrates are much less studied than their vertebrate counterparts. Um, so we're kind of trying to fill out that that part of the puzzle because um, they are not less important, I think, than vertebrates. They are they are often what a lot of the vertebrates will eat. So uh, we're kind of studying a, a little bit lower down the food chain, but I think it's still I think it's still important. Yeah, you're right. Well, I think that's all the time that we have today. Okay. Um, a number of listeners have, have written in. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Fantastic work. Thank you for sharing. There's just so many comments coming in. So um, I just really want to thank you again for the awesome presentation today. And um, if when you send me the link, I will forward it out to you to the attendees today. And um, yeah, we can add the, the funding slide to the to the presentation too. So um, yeah, thank you so